linchpin issue of this whole creation evolution discussion. To me, it's the linchpin issue when we start talking about issues just about the authority of Scripture. Because there are so many things that cause people to doubt. There are so many, people, so many things that people say, I wish I had answers for, or the church doesn't have good answers for this, these issues. This is the central question. Why can't a day mean a day? Now, I'm not asking you to do this right now, but if you were to take your Bibles and open them to Genesis 1 and just read the text, just read it, okay? My mind's a blank. I'm going to read the text. Just read Genesis 1. What do you get the idea that the days in Genesis 1 represent? What kind of day? Ordinary 24-hour day. Day as we presently understand it, right? I mean, do you get any indication from reading Genesis 1 that those days are anything other than than ordinary 24-hour days? The answer, no. Do you get anything anywhere else in Scripture that would lead you to believe that the days in Genesis 1 are anything other than ordinary 24-hour days? Nope. Scripture interpreting Scripture, those are ordinary days. Having said that, why don't many Christians and Christian leaders believe the days in Genesis 1 are, in fact, literal 24-hour days? I mean, I think we just all agree. If you read the text, you read the Word of God, it says six ordinary days, six 24-hour days. If that's what the Word of God says, the vast majority of Christians will tell you those days are not days. So if the Bible says they are days, most Christians say they're not, those people must be getting information from someplace other than the Bible. Now, where would they be getting information that would cause them to openly and actively question the Word of God? Where's the source of that information? The internet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's always a good. Well, you know, man's idea is science, the dating methods. The secular world says the earth is billions of years old, so we've got to take secular ideas and use them to reinterpret the word of God. If you do that, if you take an outside source of information and use that source of information to reinterpret the word of God, is this then your ultimate authority? What's your ultimate authority? Man is. So next week, next month, next year, when man changes his mind or comes up with a new concept or a new idea, guess what you get to do? You get to re-reinterpret your Bible. If I go to any church in the world and read this verse, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Am I in too much trouble? Actually, I'm pretty safe with Genesis 1-1. It's Genesis 1, verse 2, the rest of the chapter. I'm running for my life. Why? Because I preach and teach the following. Because this is what God's word clearly indicates. On the first day, he created earth, space, time, and light. Day two, the atmosphere, the firmament, the expanse. Day three, the dry land and plants. Day four, the sun, moon, and stars. Day five, the flying and sea creatures. Day six, land, animals, and man. Six ordinary 24-hour days. What an almost unimaginable concept to people in the church. Those days are really days? Yeah. Who said? God did. Here's a question for you. Did, did people and dinosaurs walk the earth together? How do you know that? There's a picture of them. Can't you see the dinosaurs there? I mean, pay attention. to the. I mean, I drove these things in from Kentucky the other day. Sure, dinosaurs are land animals. They're made on day six of creation week, the same day as man. Sure, people and dinosaurs walk the earth together. That's not what the world says, though. The Bible's not true. The rock layers show the earth is millions of years old. You got to believe me. I'm a scientist. You know how silly that sounds? But that's exactly what happened. Up until, say, the mid-1700s, most people in the church accepted the Bible as reliable and, and authoritative. The biblical history was reliable. The genealogies were unbroken. The uh, chronologies were accurate. Noah's flood was a global cataclysmic catastrophic event. The Bible was authoritative and reliable. But it was about this time that a group of scientists and philosophers who were certainly no friend of God's word and openly denied its historicity. You say, wait a minute, you know, this whole flood story, that, that's just kind of silly. And, and I, I just, you know, we're not going to believe that because this whole God thing is really, you know, we're, we're, we're just not buying into that. But at the same time, most people accepted that the sedimentary rock layers were laid down by the flood. They said, no, no, wait a minute. 
You see these processes of sedimentation we see in our world today? Maybe if these processes have gone on for long periods of time, the processes we see in the present can help us account for things in the past. Yeah, yeah, this is what happens. These slow processes of sedimentation, so the earth is not 6,000 years old. The earth is tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or perhaps even a few million years old. And see, this idea became more popular and more popular in scientific and philosophic circles and more popular and more popular. Then you know where it became popular? In the church. Particularly the intellectual elite of the Church of England. I said, wait a minute, you know, these scientists are pretty smart guys. And be admitted, you know, we all you know, worship education. And, and I'm very pro-science, don't get me wrong. But, you know, these scientists know something God doesn't know. And they, they've just proven that, you know, that, that these layers are, you know, uh, are tens of thousands of years old or millions of years old. Well, the biblical chronology is not accurate. This is what we'll do. We'll just take the millions of years and add them to the Bible. Folks, that's when the church lost its grip on the authority of Scripture. And it was about this time that a young man went off to college to start his studies. He originally went to college to become a physician, like his father and his grandfather. But he pretty quickly decided that medicine wasn't for him, so it was decided he would become a country clergyman. So his field of study was changed to theology. Anybody know who I'm talking about? A guy named Charles Darwin guy who more than any other is credited with coalescing this idea of biological evolution that over vast periods of time, one kind of creature can change into another. It was during this time that the church itself was openly questioning the age of the earth. That's when he was in his training phase, if you will. And years later, when he was aboard the, the, the Beagle on his uh, trip around the world, he had already rejected the Bible. And he wrote this in his autobiography. Whilst on board the Beagle, I was quite orthodox. But I'd gradually come, by this time, to see the Old Testament from its manifestly false history of the world was no more to be trusted than the sacred books of the Hindus or the beliefs of any barbarian. You see, Darwin rejected the historicity of the Bible. He called the Old Testament a manifestly false history of the world. On board the Beagle, he read the works of a man named Charles Lyell, who's one of the first people to really cogently, you know, set forth the idea, the concept that the earth was millions of years old. The process is called uniformitarianism. He bought into the idea of the millions of years. And see, it was on this fertile ground that he planted his observations. Because when he came back from his voyage and he was starting to examine in detail all the specimens he'd brought back, he started analyzing his data and his notebooks. It was the millions of years that was the most important issue. It's not evolution. It's the age of the earth. Because we would say, you know, tell me, how old do you think the earth is? I say roughly 6,000 years. Where do you get that idea? Well, so-and-so beget, so-and-so beget, so-and-so beget, so-and-so. I mean, you add those up, you come to roughly 6,000 years. Some people say there are gaps in the genealogies. They want to say 10 to 12,000 years. No problem. But you can't put enough gaps in there to get to millions or billions of years. It just doesn't work. So, earth is young. But the world says, no, no, the earth is very ancient. Think about this. Would you accept... The 6,000 years ago, the earth was covered by vast oceans, just a big pot of chicken soup, chemicals bumped together, and poof, the first life form miraculously and randomly assembled itself together. Now, we're going to start there. You've got this first simple life form that we could go from a single-cell simple life form to man in 6,000 years. Anybody buying that? One cell creature to man in 6,000 years, going once, going twice, okay, Everybody totally agrees that that's a no. Okay, why don't you accept that? You know, it's amazing, no matter what size the crowd, when I ask that question, everybody gets deadly silent. I mean, I can hear hair move in this room. I mean, why? I don't know. We all know it's not true, but we don't know why. Well, but the thing is, I'll tell you the best answer I ever got. Because I usually do this talk on a Sunday night. And uh, about a year or two ago, I was in the church. We had like 1,500 people in the sanctuary. And they did what you did. I said, why? And they got, it was like, it's like the sound got sucked out of this sanctuary. It was amazing. And after about 10 seconds, the cutest little boy you ever saw jumped up about the third pew down on my right side, jumped up and said, because it's just stupid. And, <laughs> and I don't know that I would have put it that way, but it's patently absurd. I mean, if evolution happened that fast, you'd go home tonight and say, well, the state legislature's going to do this and Congress that and such and such, the weather's going to be this tomorrow and certain, certain, certain team won today. And today, a dog turned into a giraffe. 
I mean, things would be evolving in front of your eyes. But what if you've got vast, almost unimaginable time periods, hundreds of millions or perhaps billions of years? Maybe, just maybe, you can make yourself believe that one kind of animal can change into another. You know why this is such an important issue? Without the millions of years, the evolutionist is dead in the water. Who says? They do. The Darwinian revolution began when it became obvious that the earth was very ancient rather than having been created only 6,000 years ago. This finding was the snowball that started the whole avalanche. This quote from a gentleman named Ernst Mayer, who's been called by many in the evolutionary community as being second only to Darwin himself, his influence on Darwinian thought. He says, without the millions and billions of years, we're dead in the water. And see, that's why this is such an emotional issue for the evolutionists, and that would explain why they hang on to this at all costs. But why would Christians hang on to the idea of the millions of years? Well, let's just get to it. Those dating methods. Tommy, don't you know that scientists have proven those days in Genesis can't be days? They've tested this. They've tested that. They've got all these, proof, got all these scientific evidences. Well, there are several hundred processes that have been used as dating methods. And the way it works is this. You've got a process that you can measure or analyze in the present. You know, whether it's the cave of radioisotope or changing the Earth's magnetic field or salt deposition in the ocean or sediment deposition in a river delta or erosion at Niagara Falls, those are things you can measure or analyze in the present. For example, like if you want to check the erosion rate at Niagara Falls, you could go there every two weeks, say, and say, well, here's the, where the edge of the falls is, and, you know, make your little mark, and come back two weeks, well, it's right here. Come back in two weeks and try to. And you can do that for a couple of years. And you've got your data points. You do your calculations. You say, well, over the period of time, I was observing it. It eroded this far in this period of time, so it's X how many inches a year. That's real science. But what if you say, based on what I've just observed, I wonder where the edge of the falls would have been 100,000 years ago. And you say, this is where it is, and I know the rate, and I'm going to extrapolate backwards in time and see where the edge of the falls would have been. Is that science? No. Can you directly, scientifically test the past? No. The past is what? It's past. It's gone. In order for this to be valid, you've got to make assumptions. You're assuming that the rate of erosion has gone on unchanged in the past. You're assuming that the area or the place that you're analyzing has not been altered or contaminated in any fashion. You're assuming you even know the initial conditions. All those things are unprovable. Those assumptions are, you know, you really can't calibrate those assumptions, if you will. The world says these are logical and therefore we we'll consider them scientifically valid, but do they stand up to analysis? At the end of the day, if you take all the dating methods that have been used, more than 90% of them give an age of the earth less than a billion years. Only a handful of these so-called dating methods will give an age of the earth in the 4.5 to 4.8 billion year range. Now, Am I hypocritical enough to say, well, just believe the ones that give you a young earth and don't believe the ones that give you an old earth? No, I'm not going to say that. All dating methods are flawed by the same problems. They're all, they're all involved with making assumptions about the past. Well, then that raises a question. How can we know things about the past? How many people believe George Washington was first president? Put them up. Okay, why do we all agree with that? It's recorded history. We've got reliable historical documents that are verified and corroborated by other historical documents of the day. Those original documents were verified or not brought into question by people alive at the time. We have reliable historical accounts about the past. Guess what? I've got a reliable historical account about the past. This is given to me by the perfect historian, the one who's always been there, the one who wouldn't tell me a lie, the one who in certain cases was the only one there when certain events occurred. He tells me about the past. And using the Bible as my foundation, I can explain the things I see in the world. So I know about the past because I have a historical record. Can I scientifically test whether or not George Washington was the first president? No, there's no scientific way to do that. Now, the most commonly cited Dating methods are the radio decay method, the, the radiometric methods, whether it's uh, potassium, argon, rubidium, strontium. And rather than give you a really fascinating lecture with a whole bunch of equations, I'm going to show you a short video. This is one of our new Check This Out video series. And in the next three and a half minutes, I'm going to make you an expert in radiometric dating. 
Now, this video goes really fast. So people in my age group, this was really not meant for us. Okay, it was meant for those like, young people who were just sort of like totally tied to their iPhone and their PS3 that, you know, when they answer the door, they text, hello, that kind of thing. You know, <laughs> this is not meant for us. So for those in, in my age group and above, you're going to have to listen really fast. But in the next three and a half minutes, you are going to be officially an expert. You ready? Well, you might as well say yes, I'm playing the video anyway. Okay, okay. Nearly every textbook and science magazine teaches that the Earth is billions of years old, and the primary dating method used for determining this is what is called radioisotope dating, or radiometric dating. Now this is a reliable method for measuring absolute ages of rocks and the age of the Earth, right? Huh. First off, many scientists now regard the age of the Earth to be between 4.55 and 4.6 billion years old. Okay, so if this method is reliable and accurate, why the 50 million year discrepancy? That seems like a lot, but let's get into some details here and see what's going on. Keep in mind that there's all kinds of scientific jargon on this topic, and so we'll just present a very straightforward, simplified version of the process. Radiometric dating is the process of estimating the ages of rocks based on the decay of radioactive elements in them. Basically, there are certain kinds of atoms in nature that are unstable and spontaneously decay into other kinds of atoms. For instance, uranium will radioactively decay through a series of steps until it becomes the stable element called lead. The original element is called the parent element, and the end result is called the daughter element. Radioisotope dating is commonly used to date igneous rocks, rocks which formed when hot molten material cooled and solidified. The dating clock started when the rock cooled. During the molten state, it is assumed that the intense heat forced any gaseous daughter elements to escape. It is assumed that once the rock cooled, no more atoms escaped and any daughter element now found in the rock is a result of radioactive decay since that rock formed. The decay rate is measured in terms of half-life, that is the length of time it takes half of the remaining atoms of a radioactive parent element to decay. Now of course, that can be measured in a laboratory, and it is assumed that since we know the decay rate, we can calculate backwards and come up with the age of the rock. But is that all there is to it? Here's where it gets tricky. It's true, we can measure a decay rate using observational science, but there's another kind of science that is required to accurately calculate dates for rocks, and that is what we call historical science. Historical science deals with the things in the past, and therefore it cannot be repeated and tested. Dating methods require both types of science, because in order to get accurate rock dates, one would have to accurately know both the decay rate and the initial conditions of the rock sample, right? Since radioisotope dating uses both types of science, we can't directly measure the ages of rocks. There are assumptions involved. For instance, how do we know what the initial conditions were in the rock sample? How do we know the amounts of parent or daughter elements now in that sample haven't been altered by other processes in the past? How does someone know the decay rate has remained constant since the rock formed? The answer is, they don't. Let's simplify here and talk about a typical hourglass. Let's say you walk into a room and you see an hourglass with sand at the top and sand at the bottom, and some sand sprinkling from the top chamber to the bottom. Well, observational science would allow us to see and measure the sand, and then calculate how long the hourglass has been running, right? We could make our sand measurements and then calculate when the hourglass was turned over, right? Well, those calculations could be wrong because we may have failed to consider some major assumptions. Like, was there any sand at the bottom when the hourglass was turned over? Has any sand been added or taken out of the hourglass? Has the sand always been falling at a constant rate? Since we did not observe the initial conditions when the hourglass started, and we haven't been watching the sand all the time since then, we must make assumptions. All three of those assumptions can affect our time calculations. Now, of course, there's more to understanding all of this, but enough said. See, you're now an expert. But the thing is, see, it's not as straightforward as the secular world wants you to believe it is. So I'm going to give you some examples. How many people have maybe believe or have heard it said that carbon-14 dating proves the Earth is millions of years old? I've actually heard that on television, and that's simply not true. Radiocarbon dating is not something you can use to date things that are millions of years old. The outer limit for, for carbon-14 dating would be 80 to perhaps 100,000 years because the half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years which means if you had a pound of carbon-14 and you waited 5,730 years, you'd have a half pound. You wait another 5,730 years, half that would be gone. Another 5,730 years, half that would be gone. So, you know, in a million years, if you had carbon-14 the size of the earth, it would all be gone. So there's no way it can be used to date things that are millions of years old, which is a very common misconception in the church. Well, this is proof. No, it's not. It's, there, there are only a handful of these so-called dating methods that give ages of the earth in the 4.5, 4.8 billion year range. But I found it very curious that a group of scientists got together and decided they were going to carbon-14 date some diamonds. 
Does anybody know how long it's supposed to take for diamonds to form in nature? What secular estimates of the time range for diamond formation is? Anybody got any idea? It's supposed to take hundreds of millions to perhaps a billion years. Now, I saw Superman do it one time in seven seconds. I mean, Lois Lane gave him a piece of coal, and he squoze it. That means apply positive pressure with your hand. And he went, and he opened his hand, and he had a diamond. And it was cut. I mean, Superman's bad. Except for Superman, it's supposed to take like a billion years. So I thought, why would you carbon-14 date something that's supposed to be a billion years old? Because after a billion years, there'd be no carbon-14 left. But the reason they chose diamonds is because the crystalline structure of diamonds, there's really no chance of any significant contamination. So they sent these diamonds off to the lab and carbon-14 dated them, and they found out the diamonds were 58,000 years old. Now, we would dispute the 58,000-year, you know, data for methodological reasons, but nonetheless, if diamonds actually take a billion years to form, there should be no carbon-14 in them. But if carbon-14 is accurate, then diamonds are 58,000 years old. They can't be a billion years old. So either way you turn, you've got a problem if you believe in old earth. As far as I'm aware, uh, and if somebody's got data to show this incorrect, please let me know. As far as I'm aware, every single coal seam that I've ever seen sent to the lab for carbon-14 dating has had carbon-14 in it. There are, there are universities around the world that have samples of, you know, these different kinds of coal seams that are supposed to be anywhere from, say, 235 to 280 million years old. Every single one of those that has been tested by carbon-14 has carbon-14 in it. So how could they be millions of years old? You see, you've got a problem. They were digging a ventilation shaft in a mine in Australia some years ago, and about 69 feet below the surface is a layer of basalt. And in this basalt, they found wood. And they said, that's pretty amazing. You know, we never expected to find wood there. I wonder how old the wood is. So the first thing they did, they sent the rock off to the lab. The rock dated 45 million years old. The wood dated 45,000 years old. Question, how do you get 45,000-year-old wood inside a 45-million-year-old rock? I mean, 45,000 years ago, the Aborigines dig down there and say, boy, they're really going to be surprised when they dig this out. <laughs> It's going to be a big joke on them in about 50,000 years. May 1980, Mount St. Helens. Top and side of this mountain just erupted. If you've not had a chance to go to visit Mount St. Helens, you need to. It's very, very impressive to stand there at the observation station and just see, you know, what occurred there. It's just, it's just extraordinary. But since the initial eruption of Mount St. Helens, at the, in the top, in the crater, there's been a lava dome that's formed. And Dr. Steve Austin, who has a Ph.D. in geology from Penn State, decided he wanted to date those rocks. So we went up there, and he took some rock samples, and he sent them off to the lab. Now, remember, this is called potassium-argon dating. The way it works is when the lava's flowing, the radiometric clock's not operating. You know, the radiometric clock only starts when the lava cools, when the rock actually solidifies or hardens. So he took this sample and sent it off to the lab and found out these rocks were 340,000 to 2.8 million years old. Now, right away, you've got to be scratching your head, right? That not being the most precise range of dates you've ever seen. It's like a 700% range. But, you know, that's not the worst problem. The worst problem is those rocks are less than 12 years old when he sent them off to the lab. This lava dome has formed on the CBS Evening News. We've got videotapes over the years of this lava dome, you know, slowly forming, so these methods that are so accurate and so reliable that they have caused you to doubt the Word of God have just measured a 12-year-old rock to be at least 340,000 years old. We've gone around the world to places where we have historical records, historical documentation of when certain lava flows occurred. And using potassium-argon dating, we've dated the rocks. Eruption in Sicily in 122 B.C., the rocks dated 170,000 to 330,000 years old. The eruption in Sicily in 1972 dated 210,000 to 490,000 years old. The more recent eruption dated older than the older eruption. The 1986 eruption at Mount St. Helens, 300,000 to 400,000 years old. New Zealand, 1954, the rocks dated 3.3 to 3.7 million years old. Folks, I was born in 1956. 
I am not 3 million years old. <laughs> Hawaii, 1959, 1.7 to 15.3 million years old. Wow, no wonder we doubt the word of God with accuracy like that. When you know how old the rocks are, when you have historical records to tell you when certain lava flows occurred, radiometric dates do not match the historical dates. But when you don't know how old the rocks are, you assume the dating methods work, which is very convenient, by the way. In general, dates in the correct ballpark are assumed to be correct and are published, but those in disagreement with other data are seldom published, nor are the discrepancies fully explained. This is what? My slides are labeled, folks. Work with me. These are not trick questions. Not, no, the folks in Rochester, New York, yeah, I tried to give them some trick questions. You're my home folks now. This is the Grand Canyon. Look at those layers. You got two options. Either a whole lot of time and a little bit of water cause those rock layers or a whole lot of water and a little bit of time. This is a what? Fossil. Things become fossilized because they get buried very rapidly, right? At the time of the flood, lots of things got buried rapidly. <laughs> the right conditions, right circumstances, how long does it take to make a fossil? How long does the process of fossilization take? Here's a petrified ham. This ham was on a table in a mining shed in New Zealand, got covered by an avalanche. They dug it out 50 years later. The ham had petrified. How long does it take to make a fossil? 50 years or less, sometime in that time period, this ham had petrified. This next one's kind of scary. I don't like to bring scary images, but I think this is necessary. Here's a petrified hat. How do I know this hat's not 3 million years old? I asked that a couple of months ago, and the guy in the back yelled out, because it's out of style. Wrong answer. Well, there are two reasons. One, there were no hat factories 3 million years ago. And two, if evolution were true three million years ago, we'd been closer to apes than humans. We couldn't have worn hats anyway, right? We'd have been swinging from trees. They'd have just fallen off. <laughs> this hat was found in a mine after 50 years. It had petrified. Here's a petrified flower sack. It took three weeks. Math question or history question. Is three weeks less than a million years? Yeah, <laughs> think carefully about your answer. From 1924 to 1988, there was a visitor sign above the entrance to Carlsbad Caverns that said Carlsbad was at least 260 million years old. In 1988, the sign was changed to read 7 to 10 million years old. Then for a little while, the sign read it was 2 million years old. Now the sign's gone. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, if the days in Genesis aren't days, what are they? For 15 years of my life, I was what you would call a theistic evolutionist. God created, used evolution. I mean, I was taught evolution as an undergraduate. I was, there was some passing discussion about evolution even in medical school. That's what I understood. So, you know, God created, used evolution. The days in Genesis weren't real days. You know, God said day, but he meant, you know, indeterminate geologic time periods. Some people accept what's called the gap theory. After Genesis 1-1, that's when Satan fell and God destroyed everything and recreated and that's where all the millions of years are and then there was a recreation after that. But if you just read Genesis 1, there's no gap there. There's really no room for a gap. No English translation I'm aware of even remotely translates that chapter where you can put a gap there. But some people insist that certain verbs need to be re, uh, uh, reinterpreted or retranslated. You know, this, 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 one of the verbs that's, that's translated was is supposed to be uh, translated became, and this is where we put the millions of years. A lot of theologic problems with the gap theory, but the problem is simply this. We've got to find a place for the millions of years because if you read Genesis 1, there really is no place to put them. Again, whether it's the gap theory or what some people call the day-age theory, uh, theistic evolution, which is what I accepted. All these different reinterpretations, if you, want, if you want to call it, all these different you know, reinterpretations or reevaluations of Genesis have one thing in common. There's one common factor with all these different ideas or concepts. You know what that common factor is? The millions of years. We've got to find a place to put the millions of years. When I talk to theologians or seminary professors or pastors all over the world, people in church pews all over the world, what I hear is this. Well, those days in Genesis 1 can't be days. Why? Well, those millions of years. The scientists have proven it. The Bible is not true as written. Would you look at this sentence? 
Back in my father's day, it took 10 days to drive across the Australian outback during the day. Now, does that sentence make grammatical sense to you? Do you understand the meaning of that sentence? Yeah. Okay, that sentence has the word day in it three times. And in the same sentence, it has three different meanings. Back in my father's day, the word day means what there? It's like an indefinite period of time, a season of life, right? It took 10 days. What does the word day mean there? The 24-hour day. During the day means what? The daylight portion of the day. See, we understand that because of the rules of our language, the rules of English, you know, the grammar and linguistical rules of, help us understand when you construct the sentence in a certain way, it helps, you know, point what the speaker or the writer means in that particular, you know, part of the sentence in that particular phrase. We understand it naturally. Those are just the rules of our language. Well, it works the same way in Hebrew. The word for day in Hebrew is the word yom, Y-O-M. Well, Tommy, you know, you people answers in Genesis, you just, you're all mixed up about this yom stuff because yom can mean something other than a 24-hour day. And that's true, it can. But it can also mean 24-hour day. No, 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 Tommy, because yom, we know that yom can sometimes, can, it can mean something other than a 24-hour day, so obviously it can't mean day in Genesis. Well, it can mean something other than a 24-hour day, but it can also mean 24-hour day. And I have a lot of people bring this to me and say, well, you know, you're just wrong about yom because it can mean something other than 24-hour day. And I go, that's fine. When does it mean 24-hour day? And they go, what do you mean? Well, it's simple. What we do is we look through the Old Testament, every instance where the word yom is used, to see if we could ascertain certain grammatical rules to help us understand what God was trying to tell us. When the word day or the word yom is used in a sentence with a number, that occurs 410 times. It always means ordinary day. King David got up on the 15th day of the month, went out and killed the bear. It always means ordinary day. When the words evening and morning are used in a sentence without the word day or without the word yom, that occurs 38 times. Again, always means ordinary day. King David got up in the morning, came back later that evening after killing the bear. Always means ordinary ordinary day when the words evening or morning are used in a sentence with the word day or the word yom that occurs 23 times again always means ordinary day king david got up in the morning came back later that day after killing the bear it always means ordinary day when the word night is used in a sentence with the word day or the word yom that occurs 52 times again Always means ordinary day. Anybody want to guess what my next slide is? Genesis 1, verse 5. Night, evening, morning, number, day. What does the word day in Genesis 1, verse 5 mean? Ordinary 24-hour day. Verse 8, evening, morning, number, day. Verse 13, evening, morning, number, day. Verse 19, evening, morning, number. Starting to see a pattern here? What's God trying to tell us in Genesis 1? Ordinary 24-hour day. The word yom is used over 2,300 times in the Old Testament. It is only questioned in Genesis chapter 1. Why? We've got to find a place to put the millions of years. It's very simple. Well, Tommy, I mean, you, you have to admit that, that you, you, you are certainly not an authority or an expert in any way in, you know, in, in Greek and Hebrew and in ancient languages, and you're not a linguistics expert, and that's true, I'm not. I mean, I've done a lot of reading in the area, but I do not in any way uh, suggest to portray myself as an expert or an authority. I know basic rules of grammar. Well, having said that, Tommy, you know, your uh, expertise, you know, if you have any, is medicine and life sciences. So you're really not qualified to speak on this at all. And, and I just want to tell you, Tommy, that you're just as wrong as you can be. You know, you're wrong in answers and Genesis is wrong about this Yom stuff. And the, and the reason I know that is because I've had an entire semester of Hebrew. And I think you're wrong, and my textbook says you're wrong, and my professor says you're wrong, so you must be wrong. And that's come up several times. And my only comment to that is this. There's only one thing more dangerous than somebody with one semester of Hebrew. That's somebody who's had one semester of medical school, okay? You don't want them doing your heart transplant. I made that comment at a church a few months ago. I said, there's only one thing more dangerous than somebody with one semester of Hebrew. And the pastor jumped up and said, yeah, somebody with two. 
Okay, so in case you've had a semester of Hebrew, what did the writer of Genesis intend to convey? As far as I know, there is no professor of Hebrew or Old Testament at any world-class university who does not believe that the writer of Genesis 1 through 11 intended to convey to readers the idea that, A, creation took place in a series of six days, which were the same as the days of 24 hours we now experience. B, the figures contained in the Genesis genealogies provided by simple addition, a chronology from the beginning of the world up to later stages in the biblical story. C, Noah's flood was understood to be worldwide and extinguished all human and animal life except for those in the ark. Professor James Barr, Hebrew scholar and oral professor of the interpretation of Holy Scriptures at Oxford University. Would you agree that ascending to that academic position indicates that this gentleman is a world-class authority? He is a world-class scholar. He says there's no professor of Hebrew or Old Testament at any world-class university who does not understand or would not agree that the intent of the author of Genesis 1 was to convey the idea of 24-hour days. There is no dispute. This is what the language indicates. Having said that, Professor Barr believes in the millions of years. He's what you call a hostile witness. He, do, he does not believe the Bible should be interpreted literally. But he says the intent of the language, the actual language as written, means six ordinary 24-hour days. Why didn't he accept it? Well, the Bible's not supposed to be taken as written anyway. Here's a question for you. Who created language? God did. I mean, could Adam and Eve speak to each other? You know, at least initially, right? Okay, hear the men laugh first, okay? Yeah, you're braver than I. If God had used a period of time other than day, could he have easily communicated that to us? Did he have at his disposal adequate words to describe time periods other than day? Sure. There are words in biblical Hebrew that are very suitable for communicating long periods of time or indefinite time. None of those words are used in Genesis 1. I wonder why. Maybe he meant day. Six days, yeah. Six truly really days, yeah. You sure it says six days? Yeah. I wonder why he took so long. Tommy, you people answers in Genesis. I'm just, that, that really troubles. You're saying I got to believe God created everything in six days? You're telling me that's what I got to believe? That, that's the same? You're saying that I got to believe that? Tommy, you're putting God in a box. Yeah, that's what you're doing. You people have answers in Genesis. You're putting God in a box. You're limiting God, which I find just an extraordinary charge, and it comes up seemingly every few weeks. Let me ask everybody a question. Could God have created everything in six hours? Six minutes? Six seconds. I agree with you all three times. My God is so awesome and so incredible and so powerful, he could have used any time period he chose. I am not limiting God. You know what I'm doing? I'm believing him. It's not a question of what he could have done. It's a question of what he plainly said he did. He said six days. I'm good with that. But let's go back to this question. Why did he take so long? Where do we get our idea for a week? You know, there are... Physical things in our world that help us understand certain time periods. I mean, what in our physical world defines a day? It's one rotation of the earth. What's a month? Moon goes around the earth. What's a year? Goes around the sun. What's a week? Seven days, right? Where do we get that idea? How about this? Exodus 20:11. For in six days the Lord made heaven, earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. It's God's example for man. You work for six, you rest on the seventh. You know this is uh, actually part of the Ten Commandments? It's part of which commandment? I'm sorry, it's got a stretch. It's a shoulder problem. Are the Ten Commandments good moral teaching? Are the Ten Commandments inspired of God? What else are the Ten Commandments? They're written by God. I saw Charlton Heston bring those tablets down from that mountain. 
God said, in case you didn't get it, let me write it down for you. I did it in six days. He wrote it down for us. And we still don't believe him. <laughs> Do we have a sergeant at arms here? I'm, this is crowd starting to get kind of unruly up here. Christians are often inclined to take the young earth position simply because it appears to be the plainest reading of the Bible. Well, thank you very much. Don Stoner said that, but he doesn't believe it. He, you know, he, he believes in the Big Bang in the millions of years. But he said, you know, if you just take your Bible and read it, it sure looks like God meant ordinary days. Paddle pun from Wheaton College. It's apparent that the most straightforward understanding of the Genesis record, without regard to all the hermeneutical considerations suggested by science, is that God created heaven and earth in six solar days. Well, the most straightforward understanding is six ordinary days. What prevents him from accepting that? Well, all these scientific considerations. Charles Hodge in his systematic theology wrote this. The church has been forced more than once to alter her interpretation of the Bible to accommodate the discoveries of science. But this has been done without doing any violence to the scriptures or in any degree impairing their authority. Is that a true statement? I don't think it is either. In order to demonstrate that, I'm now going to take the contrary position, which is something, by the way, that my wife says I excel at. Those days are no longer days. They can be millions, zillions, or umpteen years. It doesn't matter what you believe about the days in Genesis. I don't know why anybody would care. And people like Answers in Genesis and all these wacky people that believe God actually told us the truth in his word, it doesn't really matter what you believe about those days. You can believe anything about the days in Genesis. It really doesn't matter. It doesn't affect anything else in Scripture, right? Okay, the days are no longer days. Question, how old was Adam when he died? How old was Adam when he died? You were just embarrassed to say it, weren't you? Okay, now, Adam was created on what day of creation week? Six. Now, as a general rule, I don't like to assume things, but for the sake of this discussion, he was created on day six. Is it safe to then assume he was alive on day seven? If those days weren't days, how old was Adam when he died? Be very careful with your answer. Because if those days weren't days, he could not have been 930 when he died. And if that circumstance is true, in a really sort of strange stroke of luck, you've just done yourself an enormous favor. Because you know all those parts of the Bible where it says, so-and-so beget, so-and-so beget, so-and-so beget, so-and-so? You know, those are your favorite parts, right? Those are the parts you tell your Sunday school teacher you read, but you really don't because you can't pronounce the names anyway. Well, guess what? If you can't trust the age at death of the very first man, you know what you can do with every genealogy and every chronology in the Bible? You can toss them. They're meaningless. And you do have the authority to do that. Because 2 Timothy 3.16 says some scripture is given by inspiration of God. Oh, that's in the new, new revised standard version. Is that, is that not right? So it says, all. what does all mean? All means all. You mean even those begat? especially those begats. Those begats draw a direct line between Adam and who? Jesus. If that line's broken, we've got more than an insignificant problem. So if the days in Genesis aren't days, Adam couldn't have been 930 when he died, so you can just throw out all the genealogies. They're worthless. Thorns came as a result of what? Who sinned? Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. Well, that's kind of a curious problem if the days in Genesis aren't real days. Because people say, well, the days in Genesis obviously are not days. Well, what's your proof? Well, look at these rocks. These rocks are obviously millions of years old. This is our proof. This is the physical geologic record. This is the proof the Bible's not true. The days can't be days because of the rocks. Well, that's a curious problem here because you know what you find in some of these rock layers? You find fossil thorns. They're said to be anywhere between 360 and 416 million years old. So how could you have thorns for hundreds of millions of years before man could have evolved to have sinned to have brought forth thorns? Well, see, when's God going to start telling you the truth? Well, as it happens, not yet. What day were plants created? Watch the speaker. I got your back. It's okay. Sun, moon, and stars? What about the flying insects and the birds? Five. Okay. Can plants live 24 hours without sunlight? 
24 hours? Oh, sure, not a problem. Can plants live an entire geologic age without sunlight? No. Ah, but I know some of you are on the ball here. I know what you're about to say. You're about to say, Tommy, that's not a fair, that's not a fair argument because there was already light there. Is that true? Yes, that light started what day? First day. What was the source of it? We're not told. I believe it was God's glory, but we're not specifically said X is the source of light. There was light on day one. Maybe that light was adequate to drive photosynthesis. So, well, we'll just kind of get rid of that day four argument. So, you know, we won't need that. Do certain plants need birds and or insects to reproduce? Can they live two days without those creatures? Can they live two geologic ages without those creatures? No. You see, you got a problem. You got two different accounts of origins. You've got what God's word says, you've got what man's word says. If you've got two accounts of origins and they don't agree and one of them is right, the other one's what? And guess what? If you take man's account of origins, you don't have one problem with God, you've got two. He's not only forgetful, he's incompetent. He can't remember how long it took him to do it and he can't remember the order he did it in. And see, that's still not your biggest problem. Was Noah's flood a global event? Did it cover all the world? Or just part of it? All of it? So you don't believe that it was just local? <laughs> what makes you think that Noah's flood actually covered all the earth? Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail and the mountains were covered. I'm not a geologist. I'm not a hydrologist. I'm just an old country doctor. I know one thing about water. It runs downhill. If it says the mountains were covered, what does it mean? It means the mountains were covered. Is there any evidence that there was a global, worldwide cataclysm? Yeah, you know where that evidence is? Everywhere. Beings of dead things, buried in rock layers, laid down by water all over the earth. But you see, you got a problem. That only works if those days are ordinary days. If you make the argument that the earth is billions of years old and the days in Genesis aren't days, you cannot logically argue for a global flood. You have to argue that the flood was local. This is how it works. Well, you know, those days in Genesis aren't days. Well, what's your proof? Well, these rocks. These rocks are obviously millions of years old. You know, we know God said, you know, six days, but he meant six geologic time periods. So during those six days, that's when these rocks were laid down. This is a proof that those days can't be days. If you make that statement, you cannot logically argue for a global flood. Because after those six days, your rocks were laid down. After that, if there were a global cataclysmic flood, what's it going to do to your rocks? It's going to resort and reshuffle them. Then your rocks would be on the basis of what? The flood. See, it takes your evidence away. There are a group of people, and they're called old earth creationists, which is kind of a bizarre way to look at things because they reject evolution. They say, we don't accept what the physical scientists say, but I mean, the biological scientists say, but they accept what the physical scientists say. We don't accept biological evolution, but we believe in the millions of years. And they actively reject any, you know, one kind of animal changing to another, that kind of biological evolution, but they buy into the, this idea that the earth is billions of years old. You know their biggest single problem? It's called the flood. You should see the way they twist Scripture out, completely out of recognition to try and argue that Scripture says the flood was only local. So if the days in Genesis aren't days, you cannot logically argue for a global flood. Folks, it really comes down to this. When did God start telling you the truth? The answer, in the very first verse. How long was Jonah and the great fish? 3,000 years, right? How long did they march around that city? Long time, right? <laughs> but see, nobody argues about the meaning of day in those passages. It's just in Genesis. Well, Tommy, you've got to understand that God's time is not our time. Tommy, you, 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 you're just, you, you need to step back and think about this. God's time is not our time. Don't you know, Tommy, that one day is with the Lord. It's a thousand years. Folks, I can't count the number of people over the last two decades that have brought 2 Peter 3.8 to me to show me how wrong I am about Genesis. I mean, this is, the, this is their ace in the hole. One day is with the Lord. It's a thousand years. Well, in all the time that people have brought me this verse, this is without exception. 
all the people who've ever brought me this verse to show me how wrong I am about Genesis, not a single one of them has ever read me the entire verse. You know what the rest of the verse is? A thousand years of the day. So that just cancels that right out. See, this is not a verse you can use as a proof text for the meaning of the word yom in Genesis. First of all, this is in Greek. That's in Hebrew. But think about this. Who needs time? Us or God? We do. God has always been here. He's always going to be. This is the context of this verse. Is God is outside of time. Time is part of the physical world that God made for us. So we get to work on time and we take the cake out of the oven at the right time. God doesn't need time. We do. But the thing is, it makes no sense to take a verse in the Greek to use as a proof text for the meaning of a word in Hebrew. Because if you're going to do that, I'm going to ask you this. How long was Jesus in the tomb? How about 3,000 years? Why can't you make the same argument with 2 Peter 3 eight? Because that makes more sense because you're comparing Greek to Greek. You see, this falls apart. But just to be as fair as we can possibly be, which is against my nature, by the way, but nonetheless, we're going to be as fair as we can be. For those of you, of you who might want to make this objection, I'm going to grant it. We'll let you have those 1,000 years. So creation week is no longer six days. It's 6,000 years. Are you any closer to making evolution work? So when you grant the argument, it makes absolutely no sense. It doesn't get you anywhere close to millions or billions of years. You see, if those rocks actually represent millions of years of Earth history, you've got a problem. In many of those areas, you'll find fossils, which would indicate millions of years of death, 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 and more death. Oh, Adam, such a perfect world. Yes, Eve, it's very good, like God said. That's what Scripture tells us. You've got to make yourself believe that this is what Scripture means. Either God created in six days, looked upon his creation, and said it was very good, a perfect creation where there was no death, and man's disobedience brought death, or, if the millions of years are true, Death has always been here. For you deal with Scripture in such a way that you bear in mind that God himself says what is written. But since God is speaking, it is not fitting for you to wantonly turn his word in the direction you wish it to go. And 1 Peter 3.15, But sanctify the Lord God in your heart, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. And folks, there's one issue you need to get straight in your own heart and your own mind. It's the age of the earth. And to me, it simply comes down to this. Did God tell you the truth in his word, or didn't he? So we get ready to close this session. I just want to share with you one of the innumerable evidences in my own life that God has a sense of humor. Uh, first of all, I have a wife and three daughters, so I've lived in a house full of women for a quarter century now, which I know God thinks is, like, really funny. Uh, but I haven't had my own opinion since, I think, around 1989. Uh, which has been quite a time saver, by the way. But about, five, about six and a half years ago, we were in the process of, uh, of joining the ministry full-time, and I was going through all the, the things to, to sort of withdraw from my medical practice. And that, that summer, we uh, bought a house in Kentucky, and I wanted to get Liz and the girls moved up there because it was going to take me another three or four months to finish, you know, closing out my medical practice. And the, the week we were going to close on the house, I got this genius idea. I said, Liz, let's rent a U-Haul and take the first load of furniture up there. That way, y'all, we have some way to start, and we can start kind of organizing the house. I don't know if anybody here has rented a U-Haul lately, but maybe you've at least, you know, seen them at the, at the they're driving down the road or you've passed the U-Haul places. You know, they've got these, these big pictures on the sides of the truck. You know, come to Texas and see the Alamo or come to Philadelphia and see the Liberty Bell or come to Florida and get eaten by a shark, you know, whatever it may be. I want to show you the U-Haul I got. It's funnier than you think. Did you know the Hagerman horse grazed Idaho's ancient savanna over three million years ago? Fossils indicate this zebra-like species continued to evolve until 10,000 years ago when all traces of the creature suddenly vanished. America's first horse. Was it a zebra? Was it a horse? Learn more about the real story of the American horse at uhaul.com. <laughs> well, I was actually working that day, and my wife was to go pick up the U-Haul, and let's just say she was not as vigilant as I would have hoped she would have been. And so she came home with the truck and pulled it into the drive. And my three daughters, you know, Huey, Dewey, and Louie, uh, saw the truck, started laughing hysterically, saying, we can't wait for Daddy to get home. 
So I came driving home that afternoon just as innocent as I could be, and I turned in the subdivision. I saw the truck in the drive. I great, this went to pick up the truck. Everything's great. And I pulled in the drive, and my three daughters were sitting on the edge of the driveway in absolute hysterics. And I thought, Lord, thank you for letting me get home at this time because I'm gone so much in the middle of the night at the hospital. It's going to be such a joy to share this tender moment with my daughters. What is, you know, their faces are just glowing with mirth and laughter. And I said, Lord, let me share this tender moment with my daughters. So I got out and said, girls, what has caused you to be so happy? And they said, read the truck. <laughs> so I went over and read the truck. Let's just say my daughters were not disappointed. I had a grade three nuclear meltdown right in the middle of the front yard. The last thing I remember, I was babbling, foaming at the mouth, rocking back and forth in the fetal position. Uh, my wife came out and threw a bucket of water on me, and I gathered myself up enough that I could run in the house, pick up the phone, and call the U-Haul place. And they had just closed. Therefore, I had to enter full-time creation ministry in, of all things, an evolution U-Haul. <laughs> Folks, it ain't easy being me, okay? Go to our website, www.answersingenesis.org. Go to the search engine and just type in the phrase, millions of years. We've got lots and lots and lots of information on this. We want you to have your questions answered. People say, well, how do you think the earth is? We say roughly 6,000 years. Why? So-and-so begets so-and-so begets so-and-so. Well, my favorite resource on the subject is called, fittingly enough, The Chronology of the Old Testament by Dr. Floyd Nolan Jones. This is a wonderful resource. It's part detective story and part history book. My wife and daughters and I have gone through this cover to cover twice as a family Bible study. It's a wonderful resource. It's very readable. If you've got questions or concerns or you just want to know more about biblical chronologies, this is the resource for you. He backs everything up, he says. There's charts and diagrams. It's very easy to understand. I highly recommend this book. The Answers Book series, particularly the Answers Book 1, there are chapters about carbon-14 dating and also about the so-called long-age methods. Uh, answers Book for Teens, we deal with that in one of the chapters there. Uh, don't forget the Answers Book for Kids, the book already gone and already compromised we talked about this morning. Again, lots of resources for children, particularly resources involving dinosaurs. We've got DVDs on lots of different subjects. And again, any 3 for 35, any 5 for 55, any 10 for 95, any 15 for 129. So the more you buy, the more per unit cost they go down. Don't forget our foundations curriculum I've had several people ask me some questions about that today it is highly discounted at this conference it's normally 119 it's 69 dollars this weekend we got our kids answers library pack and our teen adult library pack finally um, I'm going to bring up something that I never thought I would act, ever actually do I am one of the tech guys at the, at the ministry. Matter of fact, one of my titles is technical liaison. I work closely with our IT department and the outreach team, particularly the speakers, uh, you know, working on computer and AV issues and all that kind of stuff. And I've got my iPhone and my iPod and my iPad and my iMac, and I drive my iCar to my iHouse, and I'm going to be buried in an iCasket. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty well locked in technically. But one of the things I've refused to do over the years is this social media stuff. Because, you know, I just, you know, what, what's all that about? And, and I, the thing I've absolutely refused to do was Twitter, twerp, or whatever that is. Because I'm, I don't figure you care what I had for breakfast, and neither, frankly, do I. So I, I don't, was it tweeting? Is that what it is? I don't, whatever that is, I don't do it. But I do have a Facebook page. It's facebook.com slash AIG Tommy Mitchell. It's a way that you can follow what we're doing at the ministry. You can follow the goings-on at the museum. You can follow the goings-on at the speakers as we travel and a lot of the very interesting things that happen when we're on the road. It's a way that you can actually uh, help keep up with the new art project. Hopefully, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in the next session. But it's a way you can kind of follow us and keep up with us. I'd appreciate it if you go to my Facebook page and like me. Uh, if you do, I promise I'll like you back. And with that, uh, I'll turn it back over to the boss. Well, good evening again. So, uh, third session coming up in exactly half an hour. Between that time, there's some stuff to look at out in the foyer. And there's pizza in the fellowship hall. 
So let's go to the Lord and bless the food. Lord, thank you for this day, and thank you for this message, and thank you for providing for us in each and every way. And thank you for these people that have come out tonight just to hear, hear about you, God, and hear about your creation and your time. And Lord, thank you that we go to uh, the Bible for your word, for your truth, and not to uhall.com. Thank you. Amen.